I'm Jillian Hessel. I live out in Los Angeles, although I'm a native New Yorker originally, and uh, I was a professional ballet dancer. So my background is that first. And uh, actually, my mom did yoga when I was a child. So I was mm. exposed to that real early and then came to Pilates in my mid 20s. I had back problems performing. I turned out I have uh, a scoliosis. So mm. uh, the style of dance that I was doing, I trained at the George Balanchine School of American Ballet in New York and went to Europe at a young age to perform. And I was there for four years dancing professionally, which was wonderful because mm -hmm. um, I was exposed to all different types of culture and attitudes. And, you know, it really opens up your brain. Your uh, world, your world view. Absolutely. Abroad. Yeah. At a young age as well. But anyway, I did have back problems. And um, when I returned to New York, fortunately, uh, I was introduced through a fellow dancer to Kathy Grant. So uh, talk about the first African-American to be doing Pilates. Yes. She was it. Um, and uh, she was quite an amazing experience. So uh, that's how I got into Pilates originally. Um, mm -hmm. And she really kind of reorganized how my brain um, approached movement, I guess is the best way to describe wow. it. Um, from the bottom up, from breathing, actually. She wouldn't yes. let get, me even get on any of the equipment <laughs> because I was so habitually out of alignment. You know, I take a how we take a breath to prepare to move. Well, I would take a, pre a breath to prepare to move and my rib cage would, you know, migrate off to one side. And she said, well, how can you possibly do Pilates when the moment you take a breath, you're out of alignment, you haven't even moved yet. <laughs> you oh, know, boy. which was really quite um, humbling. And discouraging at first? Oh my God, unbelievable, <laughs> because I had to deconstruct myself. And, you know, I think I was 22. Um, 23 years old, uh, I, and I just, I thought it was pretty hot stuff. I mean, I of trained course. at Balanchine School, and I had a scholarship at this school and that school, and, you know, performed professionally, but uh, she deconstructed me, and uh, thank God she did, <laughs> or I wouldn't yes. be here today, you know. So it went yes. on from there. It went on from there, and uh, that Who was back. I met uh, Kathy in 1981. Okay. So I've been doing Pilates forever. And yes. my main goal now, as I've, I, I'm in my 60s, so my main goal now is not to have a big studio and a, a mm. huge clientele, but to mentor Pilates teachers and um, help them along, pass it along, basically, to the next generation. Yes, and uh, Kathy Ross Nash is, is here. Hi, Kathy. And she's oh, saying hi, Kathy. In the comment section there, love, 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 Julian. Julian, <laughs> and also this woman is a true master of the work. Well, that's a spade calling a spade, but... <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. And so Kathy Grant, and it, I've heard people say that too, that sense of being elite in your field a professional dancer and all these things and then someone just humbles you by showing you your own body yeah yeah well yes. i think what she showed me was that i was getting along because of well i think training in general for sports and you could probably second this i think training has changed so much now Absolutely. from the inside out and um taking videos and slowing them down and analyzing movement but we didn't I'm talking the early 70s, you know, so uh, we didn't have any of that. And the training was what I call now kind of monkey see, monkey do. The teacher yes. would demo. Maybe there would be a super student that looked fantastic that would demo. And then you would do your best to emulate that. But if you had an alignment issue like I did, one side was working much harder than the other. And in fact, my ballet training kept me flexible and strong and good stamina and so on, but I was getting more and more and more out of alignment yes. as time went on. And I couldn't sit in a car seat with the seatbelt on or in a movie theater for more than 20 minutes without shooting pain down the leg. Mm. 
And I was in my 20s. But, you know, the attitude with dance is similar to, to, to sports. Now, of course, they do have help with, um, with physical therapists and so on. But we just kept on going. Just fight know? through it. Just play you through it. fight through it. Yeah. I, I remember going to my mentor who had hired me at 18 to dance. And she, uh, she was running the company in Geneva, Switzerland, where I was performing. And uh, Patricia Neary, she was a principal with New York City Ballet. And she went on to direct many, many companies. And I, I showed her my x-ray because I had had a bad fall. And that's when, uh, you know, my back just completely spazzed out. And she said, well, I went on tour with Mr. Balanchine in the 60s to Russia. And I broke my foot. And it was really swollen. So we just ordered a set of pointers. You know, a point shoe doesn't have a left or a right. You get a pair. Yes. So she had one pair for the foot that wasn't injured and a pair that was larger because the foot was so swollen. <laughs> and she wow. just went on stage because they didn't have any backup, you know, there were no right. injuries. And I guess it wasn't that bad of a break, probably a small one, but she just kept dancing. So that was the, <laughs> the attitude, right? Yes. So what are you gonna do? You get injections and, um, you know, do whatever you can and you go on stage. So does that mindset, carry over into your Pilates from that? No. Like, what, well, when you started- No, Kathy that, like, changed all that. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's a sense of like, you have this just get it done mindset. So does that carry over in a sense of like, people are soft these days. Like, why don't they work through that? Like, or right. is this, there's a mindset right. that has to shift, right? From our sport, from our, right. from our, from our career. Absolutely, and I'm talking about physical, but you know, given what happened with um, so many athletes recently, the tennis star, I yes. the Omiyas, what, what is her name? I can't remember. But anyway, the tennis star and now Simone Biles and Michael Phelps. I don't know if you've been watching. I know it's very yes. controversial about the Olympics this year, but mm. I'm glued to the set. And Michael <laughs> Phelps gave such a compelling interview about the mental piece. And yes. um, it, it's so important you know, so mm -hmm. important that you be well mentally. And I think all of us as, as I don't know how many in our audience are teachers versus um, just Enthusiast. clients that love the work, yes. but we, we all come up, up against that, that inner voice going, yes, you can. Absolutely. No, you can. And of course, what, what has always um, appealed to me is that as a teacher, you have that intuitive knowledge of course, underpinned with all the techn technical knowledge to be able to push the clients safely beyond a threshold that they didn't believe they could cross. Yes, yes. So you started with, with Kathy Grant and she got you aligned and body aware in a different way. What point did you decide that this is for me? Like, I want to be a teacher. I can help people. Well, at the point that I went to her, which was my mid-20s, I really just wanted to get back to dance. Get back to dance, yes. Um, so she got me in alignment and understanding when I, actually I stopped dancing for a period of time because she got very frustrated with me because oh, really? I would do, and she spent extra time with me. And one thing people need to know about Kathy is that she lived in Brooklyn and she worked in Midtown Manhattan and she took at least two trains, maybe three subways to get to work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people would complain, oh, I have to get up early, like I did this morning to talk to you. But <laughs> she was up so early to get in there, to open the studio, clean everything, she had no help, and get going. And for me, because I was a special case, she was doing it an hour earlier. I was going in at 7 a.m. to um, work with her privately before she opened the studio. And wow. okay, I was dedicated as a young dancer, but I lived in lower Manhattan. It was one train and a, and a cross town you know, walk. She was getting up super early to take two or three trains in at my age, I believe she was about my age when she was working with me, you know. Wow. So I just want to note that, you know, that she was yes. so dedicated to her clients and on beyond, you know. But um, she would get so frustrated because she would get me in alignment in these intense sessions. And um, then I would go to dance class and go back to my autopilot approach to movement and yes. throw everything off. And she got so frustrated that she said, you know, you're just gonna have to stop for a while, 
you know and i was mm. like what you know because for a young dancer as a young athlete the clock is always tip- ticking how much time do you have left you know i've got yes. to get it in while yes. can. but i trusted her enough at that point because i'd been to chiropractors and orthopedic doctors and you know foot reflexologists and injections and you know nothing was really working it was a band-aid So um, I trusted her enough to stop dancing and just do what she had me doing. And at that time, it was not cardio. But she would send people out into the hallway at Henry Vindell's. She was in a very Tony department store upstairs at the very back near the ladies' room. No, No windows in her studio. And she was there for hours and hours and hours each day. Um, working with dedicated people like myself and regular folks too. She was quite yes. something, you know. Wow. So um, anyway, <laughs> when I did go back, I said like to fifteen dancing, wows already. <laughs> I know. When I did go back to dancing, it with, was with a whole new paradigm of how to approach movement. In other words, instead of yes. forcing one side that didn't move quite as well. So in dance, we turn out right. My one hip didn't turn out the way the other did and my solution in the old days was just force it come on get the leg (laughs) higher turn out more force it and uh i now have arthritis in that hip by the way that i forced all those years ago (laughs) you're welcome but (laughs) um she taught me to match the less able side the, the 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 more able side to the less able side instead of being misaligned you know so yes it was a whole new approach and um i actually went into modern dance at that point and went to the Graham School, thanks to Kathy, because I didn't have really any spinal flexion in my lower lumbar. It was all jammed from pulling up and doing ballet, and it was quite rigid. The only way I could hold my center was through tension. And uh, Kathy changed all of that for me and opened up yes. a whole new vista. So anyway, she she was really quite something. Oh, thank you. I see someone saying, what a wonderful testimony. Um, what is everyone Absolutely. else saying? It is almost yes, impossible Scott. to get people to step, to stop. Yes, to stop what they are doing outside the studio for a time so the work can balance the body. It's absolutely true. And, mm. you know, it goes for someone who works in an office aligning, you know, the level of the computer screen and the, the seat and how are they sitting? What are they doing yes. during the day? Because if they are working with you to three hours a week and then going back to their old habits, it's really impossible. It's really impossible. You know, Kathy had me thinking about, well, first of all, I, you know, dancers at the time used a shoulder bag. And of course I had one shoulder higher than the other with my scoliosis. And so the first thing she had me do was go out and buy a backpack so that it was level, you know, and then I would patch myself riding the subway standing you know, trying to keep my balance. And it just completely changed my brain and my approach to absolutely everything that I do. Pedestrian movements, everything, walking. She would never let anyone who had a foot or an ankle um, or a knee injury limp. She'd say, do not limp. I don't care how long it takes you to walk, but you, you must not limp because your body favors that then, and it goes yes. into your neurological it, wiring. Yes. She knew it intuitively, but now we know, you know a lot more about the body than we did. Yes. And it's absolutely true. All of her intuition was so spot on. Yes. Pilates Hotties IG is a uh, Pilates enthusiast, a lady I've had on a few weeks ago who's lost uh, a lot of weight through Pilates and hard work. So she's been watching and she has a question here. Uh, it says, do you find it easier to work with dancers versus non-dancers regarding injury rehab? Not necessarily. It depends on, we talked about how Kathy humbled me yes. <laughs> at the beginning. <laughs> it depends how desperate you are. And I was really desperate when I got to Kathy. <laughs> yes. So I was already down a few notches and ready to listen. And that was Kathy's line. Listen to me. Don't mm. move. Dancers drive you crazy because they're anticipating <laughs> and they want to please you. So they're already moving. And I find many clients who aren't dancers as well. They anticipate and they're already moving. And I'm just still talking and explaining what I want. 
you know, and they've already <laughs> moved. And I'm yes. like, no, just listen to me. And I'm ch I have a friend who um, worked with Kathy, just she's a, about four years younger than me. So we did not meet in New York at Kathy's studio, but she moved to LA and Kathy referred her to me, you know, mm -hmm. 30 years ago. And she became the first teacher that helped me in my little studio out here in LA. And uh, she's just recently had a hip replacement. Uh, and she said to me, you're channeling Kathy. I can't believe it. You sound like her. And I said, well, that's a big compliment. That is, know? absolutely. <laughs> but I'm mean sometimes. Kathy would lose patience and be mean, but not because she was a mean person, just because she would be frustrated, you know, that people <laughs> didn't stop to listen because we now know the biggest muscle is here. Right. If we don't process it through the brain first, it doesn't come out in the body. All that sports psychology where you visualize the movement, you know, you lay in bed or you close your eyes and you meditate and you, you um, visualize how you're pitching and, and throwing the ball or, or shooting yes. the basket. All of that, it goes for everything. How you climb the stairs. You know, how you mount and dismount the equipment, how right. you reach for something on a high shelf. All of it has to be reprogrammed if we have poor movement habits. I, I say inefficient. Inefficient. It's physiologically inefficient. Yes. There's a term uh, you're talking about when, when Kathy told you to just step away for a second to get this to, to help your body. When I was working, I did my apprenticeship with Chris Robinson, and one of the things that he had said to me was, "Stop working out, like stop that, doing the that resistance freaks training." You out. Yeah, uh, I was like, pause, and then I was like, "Okay, like you, it's like I'm challenged to 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 really own this work, so fine, I'll I'll stop." So for 18 months, I didn't Ooh, lift do any resistance. It was a long time. It was a long time. And then also learning that at the, at the beginning, like your basic work. So the work wasn't super challenging. And then I was also, I had stopped lifting heavy weights. So there's this like hormonal drop too. There's a lot of things that are happening in your body that make it very difficult. But the end result 18 months later was that I, I was able to move better. I wasn't training the same, overtraining the same muscles and undertraining the same muscles and keeping the same movement patterns in my body. And it gave space for new movement patterns to happen and for it to make sense in my body. Right. Right. And that's, that's the challenge. I think for anyone, you know, we were talking about active aging, anyone who comes to a new movement discipline, whatever it is at an older age, everything that you've done in the past is part of the underpinning of how you approach it. Yes. And um, it's tricky. It's tricky to relearn. And it's very humbling, especially if you're over 40, to learn a new sport or discipline like Pilates. You know, it's great for the brain yes. if you allow it, allow the process to happen. But, uh, you know, it's part of the whole American way. We want everything bigger and better and instantly. Yes, right. <laughs> it doesn't exactly. always work that way, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't always work no. that way. One of the, uh, I, on Monday, I had a freestyle where I had different people come on. I just had the privilege of Benjamin Durgenhardt and, oh. and uh, Frankie Fitness. So uh, Jason Williams, the gentleman who wrote this book, this uh, children's yeah. book. So great guys on. And I asked the question, who inspired you to move? Who was the first person that made you think, this is a job? I could do this the rest of my life <laughs> type thing. So, so I hear that with Kathy Grant. But then from there, you went on and then... At what point do you decide, I'm going to make this my career? It happened organically, really, Martin, because what happened with Kathy was I went to her during a summer when I was on an unemployment. Um, I was very spoiled. I will just go back to Europe for a while. I was there four years, year-round job, cost of living increase, pension, paid vacation, physical therapy and medical, if you needed it, you know, all the things. And, and yes. then I moved back to New York and became a freelance dancer. <laughs> I was also actually <laughs> going to school at the time. I went to NYU for a period of time. But the point being, I was on unemployment <laughs> from a short-term <laughs> dance job, which was a, a big eye-opener. I, I just had no idea how to even navigate that whole system. Um, 
And that's when I went to Kathy and my unemployment ran out and there wasn't an, another dance job in sight. So um, Kathy said, oh, I have a colleague named Corolla Trier. Yes, yes. And she's, you know, cross town, like three blocks and up one. Mm. She, uh, Kathy was at Vendell's on West 57th Street and uh, Corolla, Corolla, she was between 5th and 6th Avenue, for those of you who are in New York, and then cross town and up on uh, West 58th Street and 7th Avenue was Corolla Trier's studio. She also lived in her studio, which was okay. unusual, mm -hmm. a home studio, which resonates with a lot of us. who have These days, studios. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she sent me across town for an interview with Corolla, who had just lost a teacher and needed... A, a, another teacher and at the time you have to understand 1981 right there was no teacher training at all for Pilates and I'm sure you've heard this from people like Kathy you know we sat at the feet of someone yes. that we admired and learned in an apprentice fashion so I, un I, I, I went to Corolla's and it was so daunting because her studio was completely different from Kathy's and she okay. was this diminutive little, um, Corolla had been a dancer and performer as well. Her dream was to do classical dance, but she was put, she was part of um, Germany in the Wehrmacht, Wehrmacht, is, am I pronouncing that right? Leading into World War II and she was Jewish. So oh. she got pushed into cabaret style performing and, um, escaped from Germany barely into Vichy, France and was imprisoned. I mean, she had quite a story herself, Corolla, but she had been a roller skating contortionist. Oh. And um, <laughs> I was gonna say, me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there are photos of Corolla with, you know, her, her leg wrapped around her neck and her head between her legs and on roller skates, no less. And ah. so anyway, Corolla was probably a good 10 years older than Kathy. And uh, for those of you who don't know anything about Corolla, she was the very first teacher. She spent 10 years with Clara Pilates and Joe Pilates studying with them. And she was the very first teacher to open her own studio with Pilates, the Pilates blessing in 1960. Mm. Oh, so man. here was a woman, um, a minority, you know, she'd been in a concentration camp, came through, I mean, she almost died of starvation. She was um, really, qu she had quite a story. She tried to write her memoirs and it was too many nightmares for her. She never finished. But really? anyway, Cor Corolla hired me, and I was making $7 an hour, I think. Um, maybe it was 4 I, and I got up to 7 It was a crazy low pay, <laughs> but I was watching a master teacher and watching the more advanced teachers, and I learned a completely different approach to the work. Simultaneously, I went to Kathy for my private lessons, and then I learned to teach at Corolla's and I would go back and forth between the two women. And I think that's what made me a hybrid from the get go, yes. having the dance background, the yoga background, and um, then the modern dance background, then Pilates with Kathy and Corolla simultaneously. They were so different. And uh, so I just learned to adapt, you know, so you develop your own brand, your own well over not time, brand, yeah, yeah. Over not time. brands are wrong word, but like your own do, yes. approach. And yeah. um, the thing that was wonderful about Corolla Studio was very busy. It was a completely different approach of how she ran the business from how Kathy had adapted her her studio, and um, I, it was really quite something to see the people who came through there and how she handled them. There was a bit of a a circuit going on, unless there was an injury. But okay. um, we did a lot of hands-on training. Corolla drilled us and drilled us and drilled us. And I'm sure you hear it from other second-generation teachers like me. The whole thing was looping back to how we guide the client and support them in their movement so that they can push beyond a barrier they, and do things they never thought that they could safely. Yes. So, um, so what would be, 
Oh, sorry. So can you give an example of the business model difference between the way that Kathy and Corolla would teach? Like what would be something that would be distinctly uh, different between well, the two Kathy, ways that they took approach Kathy to was a solo <clears throat> operator. She had a couple of dancers that she helped, you know, a, when she needed to be out of town or, you know, she would teach one dancer to help another dancer if the dancers were going on tour. But essentially Kathy ran the whole place with very little assistance until she got quite a bit older. And um, Corolla always had at least two other um, trainers on the floor with her. And okay. Corolla did a lot of the sales pitch. So if you went to Corolla, it was a bit of a performance. You did your first session always with Corolla. She had, it was very dramatic. She had a mirror on wheels and she would roll it out. Okay. You would do your first session with Corolla one-to-one. -one, and it was a posture analysis, which I do to this day with brand new clients because you stand in front of the mirror and you work not where she's telling you what to do, but in tandem with Corolla, she would analyze how are you, you know, and one of her famous lines was, so your back hurts, let me see your feet. She would start from the feet and work her way up from the yes. foundation to see, because if the feet were doing something funky, then you're, you know, and she would say, if the body is a building, the feet are the foundation. So if you're rolling in or out on your feet or not using them correctly, you're not recruiting the muscles up the rest of the body. The rest of the chain. Yeah, absolutely. Right. right. So that was... Um, her thing. Then immediately she would go into the posterior lateral breathing. She'd have, have you sit and round over on the reformer and hold your ribs and instruct you to breathe, you know, like a balloon. And um, then from there, you went right into footwork on the reformer if you were healthy. Kathy had a totally different approach. But you asked about the business part. Corolla yes. rolled people through in a circuit if they were healthy, they essentially had a 55 minute circuit that they did. Okay. And then if it was your first time, this is very interesting. She had two lounge chairs, you know, the kind that you sit in and then you lay back and then you recline. Yes. yes. And she made everybody except the dancers, if they were running off to a, um, to a rehearsal rest for 10 minutes after the workout and this goes back to the whole brain really? thing yes because new york is such a busy thing you know you'd go up in an elevator and be in her in the studio and she felt that your brain needed time before you took the elevator back down and you went yes. out into the sea of people walking to kind of integrate but business wise also very wise she would put you in the lounge chair right next to her shelf of books and pull out um, a scrapbook of all the articles that had been written about her and how wonderful she was, which was she was, <laughs> yes. but she was selling at, uh, during that 10 minutes when you were resting after your yes. first session, she was getting you to buy a series. You did not walk out of there without committing. Interesting. Know? That's yeah. like, that's what you call recency bias. You're like, wow, this was so awesome. I want more of this. Like instead yes. of like getting right into the hustle and bustle of your day and forgetting what you just did three minutes ago. She was very savvy, very savvy about that. And, Interesting. Um, I'm ready. She to never know. told anybody this is your last <laughs> session in your series. She always said, "Oh, you start new next time," meaning by you know, hey. giving you a check. It's it's your new series. <laughs> but right. both women were incredibly <laughs> generous to the dancers. You know, there was a different rate that you paid, and um, yes. you know, at Corollas, it, you, it was always affordable. You know, um, and Kathy, too, going in early to help me get back to my dance career. You yes. Know? So at that point, though, I, I was still teaching to continue dancing. It wasn't um, noticeably a career path at that point. You know, when right. you're in your 20s, you just want to be on stage. Yes. Yes. There's um, Blossom. Blossom. Ah. The, fam the famous Chase lounge chairs. <laughs> The famous Chez Lounge chairs, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so that rest time and that time to integrate and say, and here in LA, you know, people jump into traffic in their car, you yes. know, and your brain is a little bit wonko if you've really done the work well. When I got yes. out of Kathy's, because I would be there sometimes two hours, you know, and mm -hmm. no windows, and I would go out and, you know, it would, if it was a, a winter day, suddenly it would have turned dark, you know, and I was like, do I go right? Do I go left? Do I go east, yeah. west, north? South? What? Where am I? What am I doing? Right. You know? <laughs> yes. 
Wow. Those, I, that's a, such an interesting piece. I'm sure, like you're saying, just about the rest and the chair. I, that just reminds me of, you know, working in big box gyms and all the strategies to get your clients to renew. And, and they've, they've brought it down to a science these days and to see how organically she was doing that back yeah. then. Yeah, yeah, she was. She was a strict taskmaster too, just in terms of cleanliness in the studio. And Kathy was the same. There was a whole ritual to clean at the end of the day with both ladies. And keep in mind, Kathy... Ramana and Lolita San Miguel all worked for Corolla first. Mm. So, you know, you see that tree, that lineage, and how the yes. root is the same, you know. Corolla was a big part of the root of, you know, the first generation teachers because um, people went to, to Corolla and didn't even necessarily know Joe was still working again, like a few blocks away. Not in my time, but mm -hmm. in an earlier time. You know, right. Lita San Miguel will tell the story how um, she was working out at, at Kathy's, at, at, no, sorry, at Corolla's, Corolla's, alongside Kathy, who was teaching there. And um, they, they wanted to, they were career transitioning. And uh, Kathy said, well, let's go to Joe. And Lolita said, who's Joe? You know, she didn't know. <laughs> and um, they ended up, those two ladies are the only two uh, who got certified by Joe Pilates to teach of the first yes. generation teachers, you know. So um, kind, kind of amazing stories, but how close they all were because Drago's gym was on West 56th Street. Bendel's was on West 57th. Corolla was on uh, West 58th and 7th, Joe, you know, was on, and the studio is still there, on 8th um, Avenue, you know, yes. all those studios in Midtown, amazing, you know. And they, were, and they were, was there competition between them? Were they still collaborating in that way where let's go ask this person sort of thing? Or like, you how, know, Corona was, was didn't air? talk a lot about it, but I, I'm given to understand they remained friends for you know, 10 years. And then I think Joe, and you've heard this, I'm sure, as he got older, he was frustrated and he didn't have the success that he envisioned. And Corolla was more successful in many ways because she had, so she charged more, first of all, and she had sort of this upper crust. Um, she was in a very fancy building with a doorman. It was a whole different uh, level of service, you know, yes. with her teachers, the whole thing was my job at the beginning was to put towels out, you know, at the, the, the headrest of the reformer and get everything set up with the, you know, everything was set when the client got there with their springs and they jumped on it. I held mm. the feet for them during footwork and all of this hands on Corolla had service in a way yes. that Joe didn't. And her English, although heavily accented in German, was much more fluent. Um, Corolla was smart. She went and got a massage operator's certification. So she knew the anatomy and she oh, could show that. you which muscle you were working on on yes. a chart. And her hands on, because she had that massage up, um, therapist background she knew how to tap, magic to stimulate a muscle yes or glide to uh calm a muscle down it was almost like she was massaging you to get the rhythm and um very very hands-on not for every exercise but certain exercises you waited until there was a teacher available for instance what we call overhead she, on the reformer she called yes. jackknife you never did that unassisted it was always you know you waited you did something else until there was someone available to help you this is so interesting in someone's comment there and troy mccarty just came in the room and said oh, hello troy. troy and i met about five years ago at a pilates on tour um event in chicago and we immediately because of the dance background and yes Similarity, you know, second generation teacher, and we we want to cook something up to do together. <laughs> but then the up. pandemic hit. <laughs> right. I, I must say, this is an amazing experience to be connected with people, you know, all over oh, the world. And uh, I ha was very late to embrace Instagram, but now I prefer it far and way above any of the other social media form forums mm -hmm. because of the movement um, factor, you know. 
and yes. the interactive factor. And it is a blessing to be a part of it. It is. It absolutely is. Like these stories, for the people who are watching this, who are just like listening to the stories, I'm like hanging off your every word right now, Jenny. I'm like, tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> it's so fascinating. And to hear how Joseph Ply is taught and then the ex the the customer experience that Corolla was bringing to it and, that, and all these different layers that one generation builds on the last generation with is, is so fascinating. Yeah, well, Cor Corolla was really into service. You know, clients felt special there, absolutely treated like gold. You know, yes. she had very high standards on cleanliness and on, you know, if the soap got too small in the shower, she threw it away. She didn't want... Um, the toilet paper to run out or, you know, all of these small details, details. were very, yes. very important to her, you know, and uh, it, 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 Deborah Lesson, if you ever interview her, she'll tell you she still uses the same method of tracking. Um, she, there were index cards to block off, you know, the, the tens in the series of, of lessons. And okay. when you came in in the morning, you pulled the cards of everybody who was going to be um, in the schedule that day. And the people on the right were in an active series and the people on the left were starting new next time, you know? Yes. <laughs> so you would remind them that they, they were starting new next time and that they owed you some money. So, um, yeah, kind of, kind of amazing how she evolved her business model. She was a very savvy businesswoman at a time when you think about it, very few women ran their own business in the early right. 60s. She That's was what, such yeah. a groundbreaker, not just in Pilates, but in women, you know. Right. And Kathy too, but she was under, you were asking what was the difference. Kathy was in ben, Henry Bendel's in this department store, so she had to report back to central casting so to speak you know yes yes and get all her numbers and it was very very different she had to operate by the rules of the store although when you got into her studio they were her rules yes let's and see what does this say jackknife i've got my contacts in it can you read that is the term sure. mari windsor used in her video yes i always heard overhead makes sense yeah i think that what's nice just to answer that question is to relate the exercises on all the other equipment back to the mat work terminology. It gets so yes. confusing when it's the same exercise essentially, but a different name, you know, it's mm. so confusing. It is, it is. And then the next question, it sounds like Corolla added uh, the service part that is now standard in so many studios today. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, although with that said, when you have a bank of five reformers and a group class going on, you're not going to be fetching the long box for people. you got to train your clients. And, <laughs> and I would think, you know, philosophically in terms of what we were talking about earlier, in terms of how you recruit the muscles in your body, you're watching your client, how they go over and pick up the box and put it on. Yes. They're lifting efficiently and carrying over the lessons of being physiologically efficient and movement savvy in everything that they do, you know, yes. setting up the springs. Um, and Corolla would yell at us, by the way, if we were servicing the client and doing something wrong and not taking care of our own body, she'd say, you can't do that for eight hours a day. You have to do it this way, take care of your own body. And that loops back to most of us as teachers that, you know, yes. we're so into the service part, we're not taking care of number one, you know, balance. very important. Very, very important. important. Yeah. So we have all these life lessons and rich, rich experiences. What becomes your message now for your people when it comes to service, the way that you teach, the things that you place importance on, like all those things, like how did that blend into your, the way that you present Pilates? Well, one of the things, um, you know, I, I mentioned how Kathy deconstructed me and I moved very slowly at the beginning, but I think the progression is that once the underpinnings are there, we do need to speed things up. You know, uh, originally things were supposed to be a circuit. The transitions between the exercises are yes. very important. And um, it's not always taught that way. It gets sometimes so analytical, so slow. And then out here in um, Los Angeles, you know, they, I think we kind of pioneered with the celebrities, the one-to-one -one aspect because 
none of these studios we're talking about, Joe's, Corolla's, Romana's, Kathy's, none of them were exactly one-to-one -one except maybe the first lesson when, or if there was an injury, of course. Yes. Um, uh, Kathy spent more time with me because of my injury, but um, it, it needs to flow. The work needs to flow, whether it's on one piece of equipment or in a circuit on all the different pieces of apparatus. And I too, Martin, have a training from um, UCLA and uh, American College of Sports Medicine in weightlifting and you know personal training and you know that we look at the body very differently yes in, you know sort of a an inverted pyramid system on in terms of load but also you know i learned upper body push uh, upper body pull lower body push lower body pull. yes agonist um, antagonist front back side you know i'm always looking in the course of an hour if it's a regular workout that everything is balanced Yes. You know, that everything is balanced. Um, so, you know, I, I, I like to impart that to teachers to think about, you know, to give a balanced workout. And if you're constantly talking, and I, I can be guilty of that, but sometimes I'm just singing and counting and trying to get them to flow. <laughs> yes. But if we're talking at them while they're doing the work, the brain goes into overdrive and can't take any more information in. Right. Yeah, exactly. I think if I was sometimes singing... Sometimes you just got to shut up, you know, yeah. and watch them. <laughs> right, exactly. That works for me. If I was singing, that might hurt my renewals. So i just let them move. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> What now? I see like Ply's hot as IG. Angela has been messaging and uh, commenting here, and there may be others who aren't Ply's instructors yet. What's your message for someone who is who wants to get into the Pilates world, into teaching and stuff? Like, how? What's your advice for them in getting started? Well, I think I mentioned it earlier. Is to find someone who inspires you. You know, when I moved out west, I had the good um, fortune to meet Ron Fletcher. Eve Gentry, you, mm. you want to find somebody of, you know, the current generation that's living and um, someone that you want to sit at their feet and learn from them, that mm -hmm. they, you feel like they're dispensing pearls of wisdom. And um, I think that, that you want to be inspired because how do you inspire other people unless you're inspired? And it doesn't necessarily have to be only Pilates, you know, we draw right. from all of our experiences. I think so often of um, the the dance teachers that inspired me, um, you yes. know, and that that love to move. I, I, I just really think that we want to impart, Ron was great about that because Ron would inspire people to move, non-dancers as well as dancers. He wanted them to have that extra, you know, what, what is it? You know, you walk in the yes. room and you go, who is that? Do you know? Because yes. of the way the person carries themselves, there's that sense of confidence from the inside out that inside dancers out. naturally project. But why shouldn't everyone have that? That sense of being well and confident in your own body. Athletes have it. You see it, you know, these, these Olympians, it's amazing, yes. you know. A swagger. And um, yeah. why yeah. shouldn't everyone be well in their body? That's what Joe wanted. Yeah. Everyone on the planet, not just the dancers. Right, Everybody. right. Yeah, so for absolutely. up and coming Pilates teachers, find people who inspire you, you know, and don't be in a hurry. That's the thing too. Everyone wants to get through their training, get through yes. their observation time. We're learning all the time, forever. Forever. Forever, that's what keeps it fresh. Yes, absolutely, love that. You had some questions for me, and we have like six minutes left. This is <laughs> like I'm hanging off your every word. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like um, because I'm late to social media, I am kind of missed the boat of the generation that's maybe, I don't know your age, but I know you have pretty young kids. Is that right? Uh, I'm 46. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, that's 20 years younger than I am, you know. But I got into Pilates very early and continued my dance career for such a long time. I got married at 38 and adopted kids in my 40s. So my kids oh, are wow, probably the yeah. same age as yours. <laughs> I have kids in, my, in their 20s, in their early 20s. So yes. I kind of dropped out of the whole big scene for a long time 
my kids turned out um, to be both kind of special needs. And, you know, mm. it's always a dichotomy. If you have children and a career, what yes. do you do? You know, and there's that, that, amount of time that you can get in there and have an effect. So um, I feel like I've missed all of the up and coming teachers like yourself that are the um, younger generation and of course, even younger than yourself. Yes. But I, you know, and then there's been this whole thing that's been an undercurrent of diversity, mm -hmm. you know, and I feel like I'm a little bit, you know, coming out of my bubble, although I don't want to completely exit it. <laughs> Um, so I'm just curious how you, you got into Pilates. Obviously, I, I think I watched one of your earlier shows where you said you were much bigger and bulkier and then you stopped and got into Pilates. Yes. I didn't know Chris Robinson was your, um, your mentor. That's very interesting. He was my, one of my first teachers. Now, I did, um, I did peak Pilates. I did some courses here locally as well. And then as I wanted to dive deeper, Lily Viola has her studio in Toronto and she had Chris Robinson coming in to teach a course. And she was like, you have to learn from this guy. He's not a dancer. He's a guy. He's an athlete. He's a black yeah. male, right? So you That's have fantastic. all, so it's like, you, there's an opportunity to learn from someone who has a similar background, athletic background, because I, right, you, there's this, there's the dancers and the non-dancers in the plot yes, world in my eyes, very much. right? Yeah. So she was the one who pointed me to Chris for that course. So I registered and did the class with him. And that's when he challenged me to change my football body to one that can have Pilates received into this body. Um, but yeah, but I mean, I've, I've been in personal training. I opened a business in 2002. So I've been in, in, in fitness for, for some time. But I recognize that there wasn't, there wasn't that many men doing Pilates and there definitely wasn't that many brothers doing Pilates. Right. 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 So this is something where it could be, it could give me that as from a business perspective, because, you know, all the personal trainers out there didn't have Pilates in their back pocket. And I realized how good it felt in my body. And I wanted people to feel that good. I wanted athletes to recognize that this could be a missing link for them. Yeah. And you know what I mean? So having done all those special interest courses in my peak, when I found out that Chris was doing an apprenticeship, that's when I dove deep into it and did my 600 hour, which turned out to be like 800 because I failed one of the middle courses. And like, you know, there's, it was humbling. There's that unlearning that has to happen that you walk in with. I've, I've been in fitness for 15 years and I've, I've done a Pilates class before and it, it rocked me. I, I wanted to quit because I felt like this is too hard, but now I need to lean back into it and just learn. And like you said earlier, just be patient with the process and just learn through all that. And that's, that's kind of what brought me to today where now I, I, I love it. I want to get more men into it. I'm really passionate about getting men moving and understanding how this can, can really change their world. So great. Great. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled to, uh, to know you and yes. thank you for inviting me today. Um, it's been a lot of fun and um, mm -hmm. hopefully met some new people. Yes. <laughs> And um, yeah, maybe we'll we'll do a movement uh, sequence next time because I've that would watched be you super when fun. you've done that. Yeah, yeah, yes. it's terrific. Oh it's yes, really, really fun. So, Absolutely. All right. Thank, yes, thank you so much to everyone who joined us. I see Ellie Troy and Blossom and Jamie White is one of my teachers. She's fantastic as well. She's been a great. Uh, she's been so life giving for me as well. So thank you to everyone who's been cheering on Jillian today. And uh, I'll send you the replay for this later. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your time today. Jill. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. And thanks to everybody. All right. Okay. Bye -bye. I'm going to sign you off. Thank you. Wow.